Hey everyone and welcome back to the news. We've got massive classic updates, level 120 boosts being data mined, and some real talk. Titles, thumbnails, sponsors, I've heard you, and today we're going to have a real honest talk about what all of that stuff means, plus a bit of a game studio update. And speaking of which, a Patreon update. Our art team, in spite of having to prep for Gamescom, has found the time to make two special bonus items for this month's physical tier. You will get these dead gorgeous, nostalgic as hell landscapes, as well as the three-piece paladin Set. It's the best way to support our channel and it really makes content like the complete history of World of Warcraft possible. Our big video went up yesterday, it's our new series, so uh, if you missed it, be sure to check it out, uh, people seem to have really loved it so far. I mean, for that series, we've got a few numbers that may shock you a little bit and I'll get into those later. But first, let's get into our main news topic, the level 120 boost. Now, it's kind of a spicy one, so a level 120 character boost has been data mined in the patch 8.2.5 build, sort of. The only elements of it that have actually been data mined are the new zones with there being a Kulturas and Zandalari 120 character boost area. Now, these would, I assume, be just like the Legion airships that boosted characters will have received their training on in the past. Now, this is, of course, something that we all do expect to see eventually, but I guess there's a bit of a question on everyone's mind, given how Blizzard have monetized Battle for Azeroth more than any other expansion in World of Warcraft's history. So there are suspicions that rather than uh, having this launch with the next expansion's pre-order, that they might uh, actually launch it a bit earlier. Now, this whole level boost thing, right, this kicked off with a level 90 boost years ago. The level 90 boost was months after patch 5.4, the final patch of MOP, and things happened in a similar manner for Legion, with its level 100 boost being available once Legion was available for pre-order. And then once again, we saw the same thing with Battle for Azeroth. So generally, the boosts to level cap, they've been available months after the final raid of an expansion actually comes out. Now, it's perfectly possible that that trend will continue. However, it is the case that, yeah, Blizzard absolutely have been monetizing Battle for Azeroth in a more heavy-handed fashion as of late, and it's also the case that the patch timings for this expansion are totally out of sync with what I have to imagine their original plan was. Because, you see, if Battle for Azeroth was following the timings of Legion's patches, we would be two or three weeks off the final content patch. 7.3 came out two months before BlizzCon, and Antorus unlocked on the 24th of October. Battle for Azeroth pre-order started on the 30th of January the following year, and, of course, that brought with it the max level character boost. Well, things are really quite different with this expansion. As I covered in this video, we're likely to have the final Battle for Azeroth raid open up on the start of uh, January, this coming January, with the final content patch either dropping late November or early December. Now, if Blizzard's usual expansion plan is to, you know, announce it at BlizzCon and then follow it up with um, a release the next August, then we would be looking at the level boost being on sale closer to the raid than is normal. However, there's another option, and this is one that is fairly in alignment with Blizzard's far heavier monetization of the Battle for Azeroth expansion. They could launch that level boost in 8.2.5 or 8.3. Now, here would be their, like, public thinking about it. BFA launch was a wash. They could even acknowledge that. 8.2 fixed a lot. 8.3 is probably going to be a really brilliant patch, so why not offer a level 120 boost to get people right into the action? Now, that would be their, you know, their PR sort of announcement for. That's what it would sound like. Of course, having a level cap boost while the level cap is still highly relevant, I imagine that would be a massive moneymaker for them. Now, remember, World of Warcraft is not doing tremendously well based off subscriptions. It's doing tremendously well based off additional purchases. And look, when I say that, it's not just Scuttlebutt. Blizzard PR have sort of said to me, I mean, kind of by omission, but they've said in official communications to me that they wanted me to say that publicly. It's no secret. When I was doing a video on World of Warcraft subscriber numbers back in the day, they told me to tell you that subscriptions are no longer the best sole metric of World of Warcraft's health. And yeah, that does mean that it's things like the store amounts and the character boosts that are really very relevant to World of Warcraft health as a product. Now, being real with you, you know, I've got to imagine that Blizzard look at the Final Fantasy XIV premium swimsuits and uh, all of their boosts, the way you can boost through the story content. Blizz, obviously, like, they're going to look at that and think, wow, I wish we could get away with that. But for whatever reason, the Final Fantasy XIV audience seems to be a lot more okay with that type of thing than the World of Warcraft audience is. As for why, well, that's maybe a deeper uh, discussion for another day. Now, of course, I'm not a big fan of max level character boosts. I don't really think that's a great thing. 
Kinga, I'll never forget Preach's video all the way back during Mists of Pandaria where he was slogging through hours of LFR dealing with fresh boosted characters who couldn't pull their weight. Now, it's also the case that back then the classes were a lot more complex, so a totally new player would be a lot more um, in a confused state, but, you know, even though the classes are a bit more simple now, I think that principle still does apply. And again, to me, this all comes down to what Blizzard's direction for World of Warcraft is. Is it an MMORPG or an MMO Destiny? Things like level boosts and seasonal gear catch-up, that works really well with the Destiny-type model that's more focused on end-game, gameplay-driven, instanced content. Maybe that is what they really think that modern World of Warcraft is, and maybe they think that Classic is coming so that more traditional role-playing game option will exist. And I suppose I have to wonder, will Blizzard feel more free to push WoW in that kind of modern direction if Classic exists and does well? I mean, it's hard to know, and overall, I think this BlizzCon is going to be so fascinating because we're going to see the core of the new expansion, and uh, man, just after BFA, I'm so keen to see what direction Blizzard takes it with. But next, though, it is time to talk shop. Now, before we get on to sponsorships, titles, and thumbnails, I want to fill you in with my plan. I don't really get an opportunity to, like, actually just talk openly with you guys because, you know, the way we do videos and I don't stream that much. Well, I haven't streamed in years. So, you probably noticed the job listings that we had. Now, that was crazy. We had over 550 applicants, which just blew our minds. Uh, overall, we plan to expand the team across both channels to double its current size. Ideally, we want two to three writers and another editor. On the World of Warcraft side, I want to get our new series being a solid weekly thing, and I want another weekly series that's um, a little bit further off. That'll um, bring us to four videos a week. Now, that's one that will have to have its own dedicated staff because it's going to be a massive endeavor, so that will be a little bit off. And um, We've just rented additional office space uh, to house the, the new expansion, and and, uh, I mean, if you do the napkin maths, yeah, it's pretty expensive to do all that. When we do sponsorships and run Patreon, that all does go back into content development. Like, personally, I'm making less money than I did two years ago, but I would not have it any other way because I just get far more meaning and satisfaction from building something that serves people and is cool. Like, it's fun to walk into work every day and just see the team, you know, working and stuff and making great content. So that's really the, the sort of high-level plan. Let's talk about the titles and the thumbnails. So my thumbnails and titles are a meme at this point. Point, and rightly so. I'm under no illusions as to what I'm doing there. I mean, hell, last PreachCon, Mike had me judging the clickbait thumbnail contest. Now, sure, they're spicy, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was that thumbnail-making process that's left me needing glasses. Um, but on the topic of, say, the Party Sync video recently, I agree. The original title there, that was reaching for the stars. It was a bit crazy. Uh, we changed that to be a more descriptive one an hour or two after the initial upload, but uh, I would have done that earlier, but I was uh, mid-re-watching Battlestar Galactica, so I didn't see the feedback until a few hours, and yeah, I would have changed that earlier if I could, and I apologize for that. Now, yesterday, we posted the first episode, of our complete history of World of Warcraft series, and you'll have noticed a far more, I'd say, dignified thumbnail and title, and I think that's more befitting of that video's nature, and I'm really happy with how it's turned out. But here's the reality of that decision, just look at this, right? Yeah, it's 9 out of 10. That video's, I mean, by the numbers, not doing that well. Uh, it's a video that'll probably break even or operate at a minor loss. And that is what happens when you don't use a spicy title and thumbnail. And look, I've been doing this for years, and I'm not trying to lure that over anyone, but I let's just say I've done a lot of testing over that time, and uh, that's just kind of how it is. Uh, people may say they really hate emotionally engaging titles, and sometimes I really hate them too, but at the end of the day, uh, the clicks do happen, and if you don't do it, someone else will use those tactics, and they'll get the clicks. That's just how it works, right? Um, it's a sad state of affairs, but it's the reality that, uh, that we live in. Now, why would a video like that break even? Well, I had Matt working on the research and writing aspect of that one for about 20 hours. I edited it for a day and a half. Connell edited it for a day. Jess and I spent a day working on like style rules, like the style guide for the series and like the intros and stuff. Uh, John, our graphics designer, spent a lot of time working the thumbnails. And at the end of the day, yeah, that's a lot of time. What's different is that this is a series that ideally will be weekly. At worst, it'll be fortnightly. Uh, but, you know, doing that does bring its production costs. You need the team in order to make that be a smooth process and just keep the quality coming out there. Now, this isn't me complaining. This is like literally how I've set it up on purpose. Uh, this is just me explaining the cost of creating that content. And it's worth noting that things like, say, the editing times, they'll go down as that format is more and more worked out over time. Now, I'm really happy for that series to even be a loss leader because I believe in that series. Long term, I think it'll do well. Critically, it's one of the highest rated videos we've ever done on the channel. And looking through the comments, people seem really excited for the whole series. So it's clear that people love it. That's extremely motivating. 
And really, content like that being real, that's only possible because on the news topics and the speculation, yeah, we go hard in the titles and thumbnails. The same thing goes for the sponsors. That revenue goes into building the team that actually allows us to make that content. And uh, really, I mean, if I look at the content we were making three years ago as compared to what we're making now, it's just a night and day difference. So that's pretty much what's going on there. That's my explanation of things. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm just going to tell you exactly how it is. Because I think, like, even if, you know, I have some of my own reservations about it and you don't like it, I think at least we can both have a common understanding of uh, why it happens. And that's pretty much that. Now, as for the Game development, man, it is going better than ever. I went blind uh, two days ago into a playthrough of our Act 1 script, and uh, yeah, there was a part of it that was just harrowing. I was blown away how well that script has came out. I could not be more impressed with just how the team have brought that all together. So we're going to Gamescom this week to meet with uh, publishers and other potential partners, and after that, we'll have to decide, are we going with a traditional publisher route, or are we going with the community, something a bit different? So there's a lot more there that I'd love to share, but I don't want to overshare too early. I want to wait until the time is right. As for what Gamescom is like from a developer's perspective, um, I can fill you in a little bit on what happens there. So it's going to be my second one. So if you're going there as a dev and you're not like showcasing to the public, you're going to be in the business area. So there's no public there. Now, instead, that is a hall that's full of developers, publishers, middleware companies, localization companies, and far more. And then there is a app that you use to organize meetings. And just about everyone is on the app and you get like your time slots. So yeah, we're heading over there with the Northern Irish delegation under the UK banner. And we are, um, you know, when we're there, we'll have access to a demo pod and meeting space. So it's all about talking to people, networking, essentially just building strong connections with the acquisitions people from publishers and then going home, you know, keeping that dialogue going, sending over a build, just kind of doing that. And then of course, beer. Lots of beer. It's Germany, after all, and a surprising amount of the real work gets done in the hotel lobbies and the beer halls. So that's pretty much what, yeah, that's just what Gamescom is like, I guess, from a biz dev perspective. Anyway, with that, I thought we'd take some time to talk about Classic, and uh, yeah, I hope you got your name reserved successfully. I owe Mr. GM a lot. He hopped onto Shazrath, and he secured my name for me. I was stuck in the login queue, so yeah, thankfully I got that. I'm going to be playing on Shazrath Horde when I get the time with the Preach community, and yeah, just for me. The, the, the excitement is really building, but first, let's talk about the news. Blizzard have added additional PvP servers for the US and EU regions, and this actually, well, it almost certainly means the Classic is performing above Blizzard's expectations uh, thus far, but that said, we will have to wait and see how many people actually stick around after the first few weeks. But still, it's good news, because even if 90% of the players were to drop off, we would be left with 10% of a larger-than-expected pie, which absolutely is a good thing. Now, Blizzard's Classic plan is pretty darn clear. Um, as we covered last week, it's more about re-engaging people with the Warcraft IP than, like, Classic being a separate product. They're really using Classic to bolster the overall World of Warcraft content offering. And I think what's going to interest me the most is the performance of the phase releases. So, let's just say BFA is in its end of expansion content drought. I'll be super keen to see if that's, like, when phase two comes out and just how well that will do. Like, will people hop over to Classic in the content drought instead of hopping over to another game? Now, on the topic of Classic, performance, a blue post actually warned players of higher than expected queues on full servers. And again, that sort of suggests that they're receiving greater than expected classic support, which again is really nice to see. I'm going to be dead keen to see how classic performs on Twitch after launch. It just has that potential for emergent storytelling and kind of just wacky hijinks and crazy events. So yeah, I think it'll make for extremely engaging stream content as the beta showed. And man, it'll be crazy. Like if that is able to get World of Warcraft just on average two or three places, is like higher in the Twitch rankings, that could be a lot more eyeballs on the franchise. So it certainly is a very, very interesting time. We've got 8.2.5. In testing, probably coming out September, we've got Classic coming out very soon. We're going to have a massive BlizzCon. Um, just, you know, we're, like, we're probably going to have Diablo 4. We maybe will have Overwatch 2. We're probably going to have the next WoW expansion. It's a pretty wild time, isn't it? So let me know what you think about all those news topics. Let me know what you think about our plan for um, just the operation here. I'd love to hear your take on that. So let me know uh, down below. And of course, if you're interested in uh, the special thing we've got going on this month for Patreon, you can check out that link down below as well. Thank you very much for watching this video. Thank you very much for your support on yesterday's video as well. All of your comments have been super heartening. And if you've not checked it out, uh, well, people seem to like it. I'd recommend doing that. Anyway, cheers. I'll see you next time.